Uh, greetings everyone and thank you Professor John and Binchu for organizing and translating all these talks. So as Professor said, I'm going to talk about uh, contralato approach and aneurysms. I'm just going to share this. Can you see my talk now? Yes. Hello? Yeah, okay. So today I'm going to talk about contralato approach to anterior circulation aneurysms. A little bit of my background, um, as Professor mentioned, I'm from Venezuela where I did my medical studies and neurosurgical training. And then I've been all over the world. So now I'm currently working in Tencho with Professor and also I'm part of the Neurosurgical Research Lab in the University of Mannheim. So I have nothing to disclose. So if we remember a little bit of the history of uh, intracranial aneurysms, we remember one of the first aneurysms that was done was done by Dandy in 1917. And it was done through this big approach that it has a frontal, temporal, uh, segomatic, and orbital approach, and it was called omega sign approach. And then we had seen since that time to the late 70s where Professor Yasagil introduced the Terona approach, that was a big advancement in um, uh, intracranial aneurysm surgery because he used a center craniotomy that was centered on the, on the terion and also he used uh, the natural pathway of the brain that it was a cistern and also improved uh, illumination because of the microscope use and also microsurgical instruments. However, in the last 30 to 20 years, we have seen a tendency for what we call minimal invasive like neurosurgery for cerebral aneurysms. And it's just modifications of the terrena approach and they named, you can have it supraorbital approach, lateral supraorbital approach, or mediterranean approach. And the idea is just to improve cases, improve outcome, and also shorten the hospital stay and recovery for the patients. So how can we achieve minimal invasive surgery? First of all, with smaller craniotomies, we have seen that, or either we can perform fewer craniotomies, but also we can achieve minimal invasiveness with endovascular techniques or endoscopic endonasal techniques or combined techniques, open, sur open surgery plus endoscopic in order to have better trajectories and working angles. So if we see here, we've seen how has been the evolution of the microsurgical approaches. It's just uh, examples of the terrena approaches, hip modification to the supraorbital approach, mini terrena approach and lateral supraorbital approach. So if we have pathologies in one side, we can approach to this side. But also, what happened when we have one aneurysm on the left side? This is just a 3D uh, CTA. When just one aneurysm on the left side, we can approach that from the left side approach. We can use a LSO, a mini terrena approach, terrena approach. But we have other two aneurysms on the right side. And either we do bilateral craniotomies, or we can go from one side to the other side. And this is what we call contralateral approach. So also we know that intraclanian aneurysm carriers, um, they have multiple aneurysms around 30% of them. And the most frequent locations are middle cellular artery, ICA bifurcation, ophthalmic artery, and PCOM. So in those cases, we can justify using either one approach compared to the other one. So either in these cases with um, multiple aneurysms, we can offer multiple endovascular treatment and secure all the aneurysms in the same time or the same session or different sessions. And you can see here how the aneurysm, how the patient has five coilings. But also we could offer to the patient that we do two craniotomies or two mini craniotomies as a published before by Murayama or also how we had done before. And then we're securing both aneurysms. So the contralateral approach, what it says, we open one side of the brain or, or the skull, and then we go from this side to the other side. And you can see here, we treat this one, and then we go to the other side. And this, what are we causing with this? We spares a second craniotomy and all the risks related to it. We improve the cosmesis, we shorten the hospital length, and we're cheaper for the patient because we're sparing a second surgery. So um, if we talk already about what are the frequent locations for the aneurysms, and we know that ophthalmic aneurysms, parkline aneurysms are frequently bilaterally, also ICA bifurcation, posterior communicating, and middle cerebral artery. 
So if we see here, normally the paraclinal aneurysms are located medial or lateral. And when we approach from the ixilateral side, we had to perform a um, anterior clinoidectomy, dissection of the distal dural ring, and also to achieve control. But what happened when we had this on the medial side? Is it better to come from the other side and in between the both optic nerves? So we spare the need to do an anterior clinoidectomy. So we decrease the risk of complications around the optic nerve also too and also due to the basovasorin around the internal carotid artery. So um, one of the first paper regarding contralateral control approach for ICA of thumbic aneurysms, we measure, so normally the route is this way. We go through the interactive route, and what is important is the distance between the both optic nerves and the distance between the chiasma and the planum sphenoidale. So because this was allowed you or give you the space, the enough space to go to the other side. So we measured that on MRI, and also we studied what are the characteristics of the aneurysms and what is the best uh, option for them. So we know that, as the professor mentioned too, um, 3D CTA reconstruction is one of the main things for us to, to decide the contralateral approach because we can mimic how is the surgical field is gonna look and also how is we're gonna see the aneurysm. So here we can see this one, this picture. So you can see if you approach this aneurysm from the ixilateral side, we had to perform a clinodectomy here and then expose the aneurysm and it will be under the optic nerve. But if we come from the other side, if we come from the left side, you see the trajectory is direct trajectory and we can see the aneurysm neck in front of us. So this is one example of the uh, lateral supraorbital approach clipping of the IC of thalamic aneurysm. This was the same uh, aneurysm that we saw previously. This is the right optic nerve, uh, the left optic nerve here. You see removal of the arachnoid adhesion. This is the route that we go, this is the interactive route. And you see the contralateral internal carotid artery, the um, right optic nerve. And you can see that we see the ophthalmic artery is just here and we see the neck of the aneurysm. So it's just releasing the adhesions. Yeah, um, it has one of the disadvantage from this one is that we don't have proximal control of the aneurysm because uh, it's difficult to achieve that. Uh, but in that case, we publish a temporary uh, transient cardiac arrest during adenosine that you can have a slack uh, aneurysm and just place a clip. So it's a very straightforward clip with some bleeding and then you see straight clip, then this double clipping technique here, and then just ICG to see the, the flow into the parent artery and the ophthalmic artery. So how is the view from the contralateral approach? This is another example. You can see this is ixilateral right side aneurysm. It was clipped. Then the contralateral side of tamic two, it was clipped through the interactive way. And then you can see the aneurysm also clipped in the same uh, way that previously described. So what are the characteristics for the aneurysms? So in our study, we identified that normally the uh, aneurysms that are approached through the contralateral side are unruptured aneurysms. They have sacular shape and they're small in size. Also the projection, it was super medial and in our collection of patients, we have 30 cases. Um, they have a left side uh, predominance. And I think maybe it was because a professor was a right side surgeon. So it was better for him to go from the contralateral side. So, what are the radiological criteria for contralateral approach? In our study, we determined that it was a small aneurysm, less than 10 millimeters in, in diameter and also in length. Simple configuration, because we know if we have a complex configuration, we cannot do it from the contralateral approach because it's deep and the surgical corridor is narrow, so it's difficult to, to, to maneuver during, the, during this um, surgery. 
also unbroctor aneurysms because you wouldn't approach um, a rupture aneurysm through the contralateral side. You don't have any uh, proximal control in that case. And in this case, medial superior superior medial projection for ophthalmic aneurysm is the most physical one. Lateral you should do through a, a ixilateral approach. And what is important is to have a preparative 3D CTA images because you can see the skull based landmarks and then the specific distance and measurements. As I mentioned before in our study, we measure the distances between the optic nerves and the prechiasmatic cistern, and we identify a median of 5.7 or 6 millimeters, and then a median between the both optic nerves in uh, 10 millimeters. So what is the outcome? We know uh, after surgery through a contralateral approach, there's a chance of 3% visual deficit is because of manipulation of the optic nerve. But however, it has been uh, good outcomes in 93% of the patient and it does not increase the, the mortality of, or the mobility of the surgical approach. This is proven in our publication. So if we continue following the, the the bilateral um, trajectories. We know ICA bifurcation also is possible. Let me see if I can remove this. Yeah, you want to remove those lines. Uh, I, I really don't know what it is. Yeah, I think you have to do it somehow. I'm not sure. Does anybody know uh, how we get rid of those red lines? From this, this is this is going to the community, but I guess nobody knows. Yeah. All right. The, let me see. I can start it again if it works. Yeah. Well, whatever. If it's not too distracting, that's fine. Oh, no problem. Don't bother. It looks good. Yeah, very nice looking artist. Oh, oh, okay. Thanks. There you go. There you go. All right. Thank you. So if we continue with the ICA bifurcations, you can see here, um, this is just bilateral ICA bifurcation aneurysm, one complex shape and the other one was a smaller shape. Um, so the left side was uh, the most complex one, that will be the, the one will be done by exilateral approach and then the other one, it will be done by contralateral approach. And the, the good thing with this location of the aneurysm is that you have the the contralateral approach in a tangential view. So it's better for you when you go for surgery. So this is just demonstrating again, subfrontal retraction. This is opening of the proximal cilium fissure just to expose the, the ICA bifurcation aneurysm. This is proximal control here, left internal carotid artery, left optic nerve. You can see here proximal control, then A1 also proximal control, uh, temporary clipping, and then just the clipping of the, the aneurysm, just coagulating down, then final clipping, and ICG. Then just going to the other side, you can see here interoptic root, left or uh, the right side, uh, optic nerve, agnoid additions. You see here, the A1 was there. Now it's coming to the right ICA here. Then you see the additions here, uh, agnoid additions here. And then you see the aneurysm is just coming tangential to the view and is projected anteriorly. So the good thing with this location is like the perforators are behind you. So you can put the, the aneurysm across the, the clipping line. So the aneurysm, the, the clipping will be placed in this direction. So you can have easily temporary clip because your um, ICA is there. See the aneurysm here, and then you can apply your clip here. You see, you just apply the, the the clip and the clipping line following the, the distribution of the flow. And then there's less danger to occlude the, the perforators from the posterior side of the ICA. This is just 
manipulation, checking that the aneurysm is completely occluded, coagulated down. Just checking that you don't include any of the perforators in your blades in the posterior region here. That it could be one of the problems if you approach these aneurysms in the ipsilateral side. This was just to mobilize the clip and also to put the double clipping technique. I think professor was not very satisfied with the clipping. And those are the steps again, just checking the flow and then placing small uh, clip on this dog ear here and then just running ICG again just to see the flow again. There was no occlusion. The same again, you can see how the trajectory goes lateral now. And then you see that the uh, postoperative CTA. So what we can say, we have a gray view and angle for this aneurysms. Also, the aneurysm lies above the optic apparatus and also the perforators lie below posteriorly and also proximal control is visible in these regions. Then if we continue, we continue about contralateral MCA clipping and this may be one one of the ones that is favored in this uh, area of the endovascular because MCA aneurysms are treated better by uh, surgical conditions. So if we can spare a second craniotomy to the patient, then why not to, to, to provide it? So we collected around um, 81, uh, it was uh, 51 patients in our series from until 2015. And um, so we divided the only considered bilateral MCA aneurysms and we divided between two groups. The group one was only the contralateral approach aneurysms and group two bilateral craniotomies. And we can see among them, we only did only nine patients with uh, SAH. This was coming from the, from the easy lateral approach. And the other 29 was without SAH or on rupture aneurysm. So what were the characteristics? So we wanted to do a similar to the ophthalmic artery. You just wanted to measure what are the radiological parameters that we could follow that we could favor for a contralateral approach? And then we measure what was the distance from the M1 or the, the length of the M1 and the length from the A1 and altogether how much was the measurement. So altogether for us to select an aneur uh, contralateral approach for MCA aneurysm, they needed to be less than 25 millimeters distance between the A1 and M1 together. But not just the distance, we also needed to consider other important parameters. As I mentioned before, the configuration, the aneurysm should be simple. It should not be complex because when you, need a, when you have a complex aneurysm, you need other uh, strategies. So as you can see here, uh, it was a simple aneurysm on the contralateral side, just saccular aneurysm without calcification, without secondary pouches, and less than the 14 millimeters in size or better, um, better 10 millimeters in size. And you can see this is one of the aneurysms approach um, to a lateral supraorbital approach from the left side, and um, Professor Clip both with one craniotomy. But what happened, so I'm just gonna show you a video. How is the dissection? You can see the complex aneurysm here on the left side, it was treated with the ixilateral approach. And then the simple aneurysm was treated by the contralateral approach. Just the same steps again, um, let's say LSO approach, um, open in the distal uh, sylvan fissure, just identifying the M1, 
just gonna go a little bit faster here. Did you have the aneurysm there? Already have temporary clip on the M1, and then there was some kinking on the M2, and then just a final clip, pulling the aneurysm sac between the four sets, and then just the final clipping. Then removal of the temporary clip, then ICG to prove the patency of the parent artery, and then the distal branches, and that there was no kinking in the M2, you can see it here. So now go to the other side of the aneurysm. Just a little bit surgery cell. And just go the same. We have the left optic nerve on this side, then removal of the, or cutting the arachnoid adhesions here. We have the right side optic nerve, just opening widely. Sometimes you have to just take a little bit more of the sylvian fissure to, to give you enough uh, space and retraction from the, from the brain. So opening all the arachnoids, you can see here the right ICA. Here you can see the ICA bifurcation. And the good thing from the contralateral alta approach then dissecting here is that the M1 or dissection from the sylvian fissure is easier from this side. And you can see the simple aneurysm, there was an M1 aneurysm was proximal. You can achieve good proximal control. And just to push or to put a straight clip. This case, professor decided to coagulate it down and then just place a mini straight clip. So what is important also is the projection of the aneurysm. What is feasible for the contralateral approach on the M MCA is anterior, superior, and inferior projections. Lateral projection is difficult because then the aneurysm is posterior, so you need the complex technique to cleave. See ICG now. There was still patent the vessel here. And then the other vessels are patent too. A little bit of papavirine. So just uh, postoperative control. So if we have this aneurysms, for example, this we wouldn't treat from the contralateral approach. You see both are complex. They have calcifications. They have uh, secondary pouches. They are big and size. So these ones are the indications for exilateral approaches. So what are indications for NC aneurysms treated through, through a contralateral approach? Short M1 segment, less than 20 millimeters in size. Altogether, we prefer to have 25 millimeters in size with A1, M1. They are medial to the limit insulae and the projection anterior, inferior, or medially or superior to small or medium aneurysms in size, sacular aneurysms without secondary pouches, without calcification, simple aneurysm, and on rupture. And I said a relative contraindication, the presence of brain edema, because you can see in our series, we only have um, nine, eight or nine patients that we treated to the contralateral sites in the presence of a rupture case. In those cases, it's better just to, to wait three months and then do the, the other aneurysm. So what we can say about the outcomes? Our series were uh, between the described literature, good outcomes you can achieve between 83 to 91%. So um, we had to minimize retraction because one of the problems is that when you go to the MCA, the patients, they have the risk of having olfactory problems, either anosmia or hyposmia. In our series, it was up to 21% and only 9% has uh, anosmia. However, it's described in the literature that could be 43% too. And that's for we had to have a, a wider cilium fissure ex exposure. And we also had to um, carefully select the patients that we're treating. And we wouldn't advise to do a contralateral approach in an experienced surgeon. At least Professor has done the first case when he has done 300 um, cases of intracranial aneurysms.
And this is proven in our series and our studies. So as a conclusion, we can say minimal invasion can be achieved by maximizing clip through one craniotomy and also contralateral clipping of bilateral aneurysm is safe in careful selected patients. Just to thank uh, my mentors, Professor Hernes Hemi, also Dr. Lotten, who provided a few few slides on the on the talk too. And thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Hugo and uh, Juha. Do you want to, is Juha there? He may have stepped away. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, yeah. Juha, do you want to take questions for you and Hugo's talk now? Yes. Okay. It's okay. It's okay. Okay, very good. Okay, for the panelists, uh, it's open now for questions or comments. Harshard, I know you had a question. Let me start it off by, go ahead, Harshard, are you there? Okay, he asked, if contralateral aneurysm ruptures, then how do you manage as no proximal, there's no proximal control? So uh, it depends on the location. We also published for in case of ophthalmic artery aneurysms, when you don't have proximal control, you can use adenosine. And the other way is just, uh, it's a little bit more complex, but then you have to open the neck in the other side as a, as a prepare. But normally these ones you should treat um, only on rupture cases and that you're like completely sure that you can clip it directly. Okay, very good. Okay, more comments and questions from the panelists? <clears throat> Hello. Hey, hi, Victor. Welcome from Mexico. Hello, how are you, John Bennett? Uh, how are you, everybody? Uh, nice uh, lecture, uh, Hugo Andrade. This is uh, really nice. I remember uh, about uh, 20 years ago, I was uh, with Dr. Perneski and he used to make um, uh, these uh, clips in the contralateral side uh, with a, a small, small uh, trepano. Uh, so have you ever, uh, uh, have you done this kind of uh, uh, clipping of aneurysm with a small uh, trepano? No. So, no. Normally, well, the approach that we use is the LSO. And I think because Professor Perneski was used to this superorbital approach and it's different the view than the LSO. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if the professor wants to add something. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't think if we should compete in the size of the craniotomies, how small or how, uh, how small you can do. Dr. Perneski made always one inch. Uh, one inch craniotomy, he was measuring very carefully, but when doing doing a, a large or giant aneurysm through this approach, you lose some something uh, from the angles you can treat the patient, and uh, I think it is uh, not uh, sports you should do here to compete how small craniotomy you can do because this, the patient is paying for that. So you, craniotomy should be large enough for your skills, large enough for the aneurysm, and uh, large enough to let the instruments inside and the light inside. This is very important. So I think uh, this lateral supraorbital approach is usually four centimeters. I, I think around four centimeters meters in both sides. And if there's a giant aneurysm, I'm doing a bigger, bigger opening to have all the angles for, uh, to be used. So it is, uh, it's not sports. So it is just I mean, that you can do everything through the, through the opening. Thank you, Dr. Juha. Agree, agree with you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hugo. Nice uh, lecture. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Vic, for the question. Okay, more comments and questions from the panelists, please. <clears throat> Silence. Uh, no Go question, ahead. just uh, John, to say thanks to a professor uh, for the lecture. Okay. Vascular surgery is very, very hard issue. 
to uh, and the learning curve is is very big. Every time so I, I more lecture I take, I still I say I need to take more and more and read more and more. Very good. It's a fact. Manuel's from Russia, second year medical uh, neurosurgery resident. <clears throat> okay, more comments or questions for either Hugo's talk or uh, Yuha's talk. <clears throat> mm. There is a question about temporary clipping. Yes, could you go ahead, go ahead Hugo, take that question, please. Um, I think it depends. Uh, Normally for us, I think five to 10 minutes is what we use for temporary clipping. And uh, I don't know, professor can say, I mean, that have been a long time with you together. And so that's our rule. Okay, uh, Monica Lim asks, what is your experience with PCOM, bilateral PCOM? So the problem with the, the PCOM is that they're in relationship to the octave nerve and normally it depends on the location of the chiasma and those are the ones who have worse outcome up among the bilateral ones because of the position that's that's what we analyze in our series in, in helsinki mm -hmm. okay very good um what is the time limit to use for temporary clipping or do you use any neuroprotective agents? My principle is that I, with temporary clips, I, I do the job well. I don't want to listen that somebody saying one minute, two minutes, three minutes. Usually it is going below five minutes and it is safe. I always think about the bacillary artery thrombosis or middle cerebral artery thrombosis, they come late to the hospital and relieve the patients have good outcome. So I have, I put my temporary clip, but before putting the temporary clip, I prepare well. I have clips ready, the sharpness knows which clips I need. So everything will be very fast. And uh, psychologically, I think that uh, somebody is is uh, running a mile below four minutes or some Africans are running five five thousand five kilometers below 13 minutes so I should have a lot of time to do so I don't try to be very fast don't become nervous just do my job and then take the temporary clips and listen how long they were in place and usually it is less than five minutes. I analyzed Dr. Drake's, Drake and Peerless bacillary artery occlusions. So below five minutes was always safe. And below, when repeated clipping, below 15 minutes, always safe. Uh, but bacillary artery is of course different was the communicating artery as compared to middle cerebral artery, which has its end artery. So they are different, but uh, five minutes is always safe. This is the final answer. Okay, very good. More comments or questions from the panelists? You can text a question. Okay, here's a question from Joseph Navarro. For PCOM aneurysms, is LSO enough, or do you also consider doing a mini uh, per perional, ter terional, especially for PCOM aneurysms that, that are pointing more medial? I, I have not done, uh, done uh, LSO is enough in these uh, PCOM aneurysms. In some MC aneurysms, which are projecting more Temporarily, you, you have to uh, make advanced approach, take a little bit temporal, uh, temporal bone away, but uh, usually it is enough. Usually it is enough. I don't remember a case become which I should have opened by far more because the angle depends. Uh, if you move the microscope with the mouse switch, so you can manipulate a lot. 
Okay, very good. I think we can move on to Dr. No, ben. No. Oh, unless there's a, is there another question? I have one. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hi, Sunil. How are you doing? Yes, Hello, Professor. Uh, I was asking, like, uh, what is the dose of pepevirine like you use uh, for the basic spasm? And uh, do you use this pepevirin as an IV or like in the surface of the vessels you use? Now you ask something difficult. I just asked the nurse to give me pepevirin and she's soaking the, uh, the surgical patty in pepevirin. I cannot say. I cannot say. I should ask carefully. But it is regular pepevirin. We put the surgical inside and then uh, put on the on the artery. I cannot say which is the concentration. And one more thing, like, do you still use pepevary in China? Excuse me? And do you use pepevary in China also? I didn't catch, I didn't catch. In China, I, I don't have adenosine, I don't have pepevary. Uh, okay. uh, thank you, thank you, Professor. Okay, uh, there's a question from Duang Trung Kien. For oculomotor nerve palsy due to PCOM, do you open the aneurysm after clipping? If the patient has oculomotor palsy because of PCOM aneurysm? Yes. Yeah, this is a, it is good to put the clip and then, then open the aneurysm. Then you relieve the pressure on the oculomotor nerve. I think with the surgery, you have better results than by endovascular treatment of PCOMs with oculomotor palsy. This is one indication for open microsurgery. So you clip the aneurysm and then open the aneurysm and even cut the aneurysm. But you should not ma manipulate so that you try to take the end of the aneurysm because it is attached to the oculomotor nerve. So you can cut the aneurysm. And so leave, leave this part on the oculomotor nerve. But the outcome is very, very good in these cases. If you op operate within one week, we published in 90s, we published a series from Eastern Finland, Kuopio by Sirpa Leivo on these cases. And they had very good outcome uh, if you operate it within one week and the best one within, within three days. Okay, Harshad Parekh from Mumbai, India asks, any role of wrapping of the aneurysm? No, we, I don't remember a case I should have wrapped wrapped any aneurysm. So all have been treated by clipping direct surgery. And uh, of course, if there is a small uh, part of the aneurysm remains weak looking, I put the patty and glue on that, but this is not real, real wrapping. So. I think it should not be done. If you have wrapping is very unsure method to secure the aneurysm and I wouldn't do it anymore nowadays. Okay. Um, any last comments, questions from the panelists before we move on?